so many thoughts on this show from over 10 years ago. And if I don't share all of those thoughts, I will die. Yes. That's why I started this YouTube channel, because I have to share every single opinion I have. Or I'll die. Don't think you're telling yourself. I do. I do. Butt lovers. Welcome to a brand new series I'm calling Camp or Cringe. In my lore videos, we look way too deep and apply real world logic to children's shows for a comedic and nostalgic effect. This is like a lore spin off series. Lore's edgier cousin. Because in Camp or Cringe, we look at teen or young adult dramedies and look at the theme and tone and offer a retrospective on whether or not it's camp, over the top in a well executed way, or if it's cringe. Last time, before I even realized this would be a series, we looked at MTV's faking. It. And I had so much fun with that one, I figured, let's go back to MTV and watch the series that actually introduced me to faking it, Awkward. Awkward had five seasons and ran from 2011 to 2016. 89 episodes overall, and as someone who watched every single one for this video, th that's a lot of episodes. The first episode of Awkward establishes the overall feel of this show very well. Love it or hate it, this show commits. The pilot starts with our main character, Jenna Hamilton, in a neck and arm brace on the first day of sophomore year of high school. We have a classic, yup, that's me, how did we get here moment, and it rewinds to a day in summer camp where she lost her virginity to Maddie McKibben, who, right after they had sex in a supply closet, told her that no one can know that he likes her. Say it with me, um, awkward. <laughs> The title card types it out and ends with a very harsh vine boom on the period. We then see a bit of Jenna's family life. We meet her mother, Lacey, who is very superficial, gossiping and fat shaming over the phone before politely telling her daughter that her hair looks like shit. Great role model alert! If the jokes don't age the show enough, take a look at this MySpace-like social media they're all using. We meet Jenna's friend Tamara, who I thought was super quirky and fun back in the day, but she's that same early 2000s problematic type. She slut-shamed, was insensitive to mental health, and made a racist comment about their mutual friend Ming, all within 30 seconds of us meeting her for the first time. So here's the catalyst for Jenna's traumatic sophomore reputation. It's a series of very convenient misunderstandings. Jenna choked on some aspirin and fell to the ground surrounded by pills, so people thought she was trying to take her own life. She also got this horrible anonymous letter before, essentially saying that no one would care if she's gone, and that mixed with her emo blog that she's constantly updating, and yeah, people assumed the worst. Even as her mother is hearing about how much emotional and physical pain her daughter is in, she exclaims that she wished she had a daughter that just had an eating disorder like a normal teenager. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At first, I found it really hard to decipher if this was social commentary, or are they just like, ha ha, oh, it must be so hard with all the unrealistic expectations that people put on developing minds, to the point where young girls think all they have to offer is their bodies. Mm. <laughs> it's 2011. Now we're back to the first day of school where the cheerleaders Sadie and Lissa are making fun of Jenna saying she did it for attention, while sprinkling in some casual ableism and a joke about pedophilia. Can this show have normal dialogue for like five minutes? Or is this just gonna keep giving off knockoff Heathers mixed with Dear Evan Hansen vibes? Valerie is her new guidance counselor, and prior to this rewatch, I completely forgot about this character. Even though she's easily the best part of this pilot, she's everything I thought tomorrow would be. Just good intentions, but very much a mess. Here's one of the bullet points I wrote before I watched the rest of the series. I really like Valerie so far. I hope I can continue to because she's the only thing I can hold on to as of right now. I mean, in this pilot, Jenna didn't do anything bad, but it just got exhausting watching her get shit on from every angle imaginable. Thankfully, the pep rally comes at the perfect time. Jenna put herself out there and it paid off. We even have a second love interest revealed at the end, Jake Rosade. I mean, at this point, he's dating Lissa, but it's clear that he's able to empower Jenna in a way that Maddie just isn't able to right now. So already, there's a lot to unpack. And there's 88 episodes to go, so strap in. <laughs> Right off the bat, I couldn't hold on to my love of Valerie, the guidance counselor, for even a second as she reveled in the fact that Jenna's life is going back to shit. Why do you think your life doesn't suck? So there's absolutely nothing you're feeling bad about? No. Course load? No. Your body? No. What about your breasts? She had a picture of Jenna's boobs on her phone. Friendly reminder that Jenna is in high school. Y'all are going to jail! Period! So why does Valerie have this? 
Sadie and Lissa took a picture of Jenna in the locker room and spread it to the whole school. This show sprinkled in another creepy pedophile Ew. joke. Because any chance it has to make us uncomfortable, it will take. I'm not a predator. This is my job. The only thing he ever groomed is his two Persian cats. If you can't stomach 2011 chalk out humor, then this video is probably the closest you should get to actually watching the show. Now, to give the show a little credit for its sixth sense of humor, this second episode of season one is what birthed Sadie's catchphrase of the swallow nod followed by... You're, You're welcome. welcome. Which I'm sorry to this day is still pretty funny. She will literally say the most atrocious shit imaginable and then hit us with You're, You're welcome. welcome. Like we really wanted to be told to kill ourselves. Bat shit. This show is bat shit if I haven't said it enough. After that terrible experience of Jenna being exposed to the entire school, her mom thinks she's helping when she suggests boob enlargement surgery. One of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. Jenna has to spell it out for her. Quote, you do realize I'm still in my formative years and what you're saying could potentially be psychologically scarring. So at this point, it's very clear to me that the show is trying to make a statement. But even though Jenna has self-awareness and the show is supposed to be a drama, it just feels like the most depressing reflection of society's vanity. Jenna is very smart to take everything her mother says with a huge grain of salt, but she's also still a teen. And her self-worth and how beautiful she feels right now is unfortunately linked directly to Maddie's perception of her. However, some level-headed advice is provided by Jenna's dad. Her parents are both smoke shows. <laughs> anyway, the advice. Your mother told me what happened in school today and what she advised, and I wanna be clear about something. You are to ignore her. You're never gonna be able to control the things that happen to you, sweetheart, but you will be able to control how you feel. And he gives us some context as to why his wife is such an immature asshole. You gotta remember that we were only two years older than you when you were born. Sometimes I think the lines get blurred by her desire to be your friend. Instead of your mother. Like I always say, it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation. And I really like this show's first attempt at fleshing out its characters. Remember how I said Jenna's perception of herself is directly linked to Maddie's? Well, Jenna caught Maddie making a joke about her body. I don't know what the big deal is. There's not much to see. <laughs> it was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Maddie is such a fucking wimp at the start, let me tell you. But he's honestly so realistically written. He's a shithead, but that sort of football cheerleader hierarchy, as much as it's a trope, was also rooted in reality, at least when this show came out. I don't know if high school is still like that, but definitely was when I was going to school. Episode two ends with Maddie showing up at Jenna's bedroom door. A bedroom door! Perfect for sneaking in and out. What a smart idea to give to a 15 year old. Big brain parenting move. Maddie explains that when he said that there isn't much to look at in regards to Jenna's boob picture, he was actually trying to get people to not look at the picture. He was trying to protect her. What kind of idiot would fall for that? So Jenna was like, really? And they made out. Episode three opens with a sex montage between Jenna and Maddie. Two ongoing jokes I didn't realize would make constant appearances at the start is Maddie nervously sniffing his pits and and as he finishes yelling, awesome. <laughs> While neither of these things ever really land for me, it's a very on the nose, nose in pit look at how the writers are trying to portray Maddie. Like he may not be a bad guy with bad intentions, but he is a shithead teenager. They are undercutting any heartthrob potential with the hard stench of reality. And it's one stinky bitch. Jenna really wants emotional intimacy as well. So when she realizes that Maddie loves the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as much as she does, she really holds on to that. She was just searching for scraps. But at the very end of the intro, he actually invites her to a party. We see how important the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle bonding is in the fact that they never mention it ever again. Tamara and Jenna go to the party, which actually ends up being a small intimate get together. Uh, Awkward. <laughs> Tamara, having the social awareness of a carrot, keeps taking pictures on her flip phone. And when it cuts to the photos she took, it's from this bizarre angle. Like her arm is four feet long. Built in selfie stick looking ass. Maddie makes out with some random girl in the hot tub, but in his defense, she borderline forced herself on him. And he did eventually push her away and was like, no, uh, actually I'm waiting for someone. Sadie and Jenna saw this whole make out display, but not the pushing away part, of course. Sadie then encouraged Jenna to harm herself. And if that wasn't shitty enough, she, she put dog shit in the pool. Jenna lacked Sadie's tact, but ended up bonding with Jake, who turns out to be the sensitive type. Love triangle-ish thing approaching. 
Almost nothing happened episode four. Ming is jealous that she's being treated like a backup friend. Fears that will be confirmed and ignored as this series progresses. Episode five, Jenna gets detention for beating up this creeper, Kyle. The episode then gaslights us into thinking that it was this big misunderstanding, but then at the very end, we get a peek inside his locker and it's this serial killer type shit. Side note, Kyle is an ongoing character and even though I'm not gonna mention him anymore in this video, I just hate the way they wrote him because they really made him look like a threat in the beginning and then wanted us to forget by the last season where they were like, oh no, he was just quirky and weird and discarded for being uncool, but he's actually like a really nice guy. Fuck off with that shit. Look at his locker. Back to episode five, Jake kissed Jenna despite having a girlfriend, which sucks. And Jenna brushes off his advances almost immediately. I remember watching back in the day thinking Jake was a real competitor when he really wasn't. Episode six, Sadie is still a bully, but this is our first look into how emotionally abusive her mother is, tracking what she eats and making snide comments about her weight. So we start to empathize with her against our will. Jake tells his best friend Maddie that he kissed Jenna and Maddie starts freaking out about it, but Jake has no idea why. Because remember, Maddie kept his whole romance with Jenna a secret. Skipping episode seven because nothing happens. Episode eight, Jenna throws a rager because her mom's friend Allie is over and Allie is the fucking worst influence and she's always under the influence. She even gave Jenna mystery pills to pop. Jenna thought it was for her headache. She didn't realize it would give her a bigger one later hey, because she blacks out the entire party and the next day she slowly pieces everything together getting flashback after flashback. Also when she calls Tamara she's not answering her phone. I wonder why. Jenna made out with Tamara's situation ship Ricky Schwartz. Not only did she make out with her friend's situation ship but she also drunkenly and drugdily told off Maddie and Jake. Best cliffhanger yet. I feel like this is why teen dramas are so popular. It's all the messiness of reality TV minus any of the guilt because these people aren't real. Episode 10, Jake's girlfriend Lissa finds out about Jake's kiss with Jenna. Jake wants to break up with Lissa but doesn't want to hurt her even more because she wants to stay together. Maddie takes Jenna out on a date. Tamara and Jenna are somehow friends again. And at the end of the episode, Jake breaks up with Lissa because Lissa and Sadie were trying to get him to be mean to Jenna. Episode 11, people are being asked to the formal dance and Sadie drops an ableist slur. If it could make its way into Dork Diaries, I don't know how I was so surprised it's in this show that said everything else. Sadie on our bitch fest world tour also out someone. And then when Valerie, remember the counselor I thought I'd like, tries to confront her about it, Sadie girl bossed the situation by reminding Valerie that she was once with a gay man and if someone like her was around to point it out, she would have been saved the heartbreak. Uh... In this specific instance, Sadie's asshole tendencies are once again funny because how does she know this about Valerie? This was never mentioned before and will never be mentioned again. It's just so out of left field. Oh, you know how you were someone's beard? No, we didn't know that. During the season finale, Jenna decides to go to the dance with Jake because Maddie didn't want to go with her because Maddie was trying to spare Jake's feelings. Well, Jake's feeling a lot better now, I'll tell you that. And even though it's very obvious she likes Maddie more, she likes the public attention and affection that Jake gives her. The last beat of season one is Jenna finding out that her mom was the one that wrote the cruel letter. Upward. Jenna and Jake begin dating, but Jake is still unaware of her previous relationship with his best friend. Jenna's dad breaks up with her mom because he's rightfully disgusted that his wife would do such a thing. And yet watching the mom go through this heartbreak is very difficult. Jenna's mom also actually starts acting like a mom this season, giving good advice and being caring. And at first I was very confused on whether or not this was written realistically. Did she just need a reality check that badly? And in attempting to give one to her daughter with that letter, she was actually just projecting and gave one to herself. More on this in a bit. Season two, episode seven, while Jenna is realizing that she is in love with Jake, at the same time, she does not know that Sadie just broke the news to him that she was dating Maddie before him. If you're thinking, Thinking, what's the big deal, dude? She's with you now. As you watch this play out, you start to see the ways that he feels played. Jenna and Maddie had plenty of time to disclose their previous secret relationship and how back to back it was because really she was going out with Maddie and right after, immediately after, sloppy seconds after even, she started going with Jake. Them keeping it a secret felt like he was being lied to because he was. This isn't something that slipped Maddie and Jenna's mind. They made the conscious decision of withholding this information from him. Which is called the lie of omission, by the way. And it just makes it look sketchy. Honestly, I would feel weirded out too. I'd be like, was there any overlap? In the next episode, season two, episode eight, Jake immediately broke up with Jenna without disclosing the information he just received. So Jenna was completely in the dark. Kind of like how Jake was, hmm, 
Hmm, is this whole show just a long stretched out PSA for communication, perhaps? Well, at the end of this episode, Jake goes to Jenna's house and finds her making out with fucking Manny! Dude, this is Rosati's Joker origin story. It's so cruel, it's so wrong, he has every right to be mad at them, but why did they film this in such a comedic way? Why was it shot so funny? What are you doing? Stop that! Get your hands off of her! After the brawl that was episode 9, with these poor ex-bros punching each other, some harder than others, and with Jenna's blog being made public, humiliating both of them, episode 10 starts with her being something of an influencer. After that, the two guys ask her to choose, but that's not really the focus of the episode. Remember how I mentioned that Jenna's mom is acting like a mom this season? Get ready to expand on that. With everyone chewing out her mom for not being the best after reading her blog, we get some much needed context about the cycle of abuse she went through. The day I wrote it, my mother laid into me, telling me that I wasn't raising you right. And instead of tuning her out, I tuned her in. And I did what I never wanted to do. I attacked you the way that she has always attacked me. And it wasn't right or fair. It was just a family pattern that apparently I couldn't break. And on top of that, we hear about Jenna's mom and dad's rocky start. Did you only stay with mom for me? Your mom told you that? Yeah. When we were younger, uh, I did and said a lot of awful things to her. Things she's forgiven but clearly hasn't forgotten. I... I wasn't always the best guy. They're back together, by the way. Anyway, my motto for a second time is it's an explanation, but not an excuse. But damn, what an amazing catalyst for growth. I wasn't always around as much as I should have been. And when I was, you didn't want me to hold you. That's not true. You were the only one who could put me to sleep. With your mom's song. Because while a child should not be responsible for fixing a broken parent, it's very real to see. I also feel terrible because back when I watched this season when it came out, I hated Jenna. Out of insecurity, no doubt. I mean, look, all the cutest guys are going after her. But also the heart of this show is hidden through layers of snark and meanness. And it gets lost to the developing and quite frankly, stupid mind. I like this current era of social commentary we're in, where we can cut straight to what we mean without adding shock value and cheap stereotypical jokes. But this show is and always will be a product of the early 2000s. 2010s, where that was just the norm. It's not everyone's cup of tea. It's not even mine, really, which is unfortunate because there are some hidden gems and I feel like this episode really is one. The next episode after that rare moment of authenticity is season two, episode 10, Once Upon a Blog. To try and figure out who she should choose, Jenna decides to write friend fiction, with the first being a parody of Twilight. They really leaned into Jenna's nonstop inner monologue and made it even more persistent and daydreamy. In between us watching these over-the-top worst-case scenarios, there's a lot of type acting, which looks a little something like this. Use that BFA, bitch. Give me more face. Scrunch up your eyebrows. Listen, I clown on it, but that type acting is iconic. This episode could be seen as necessary because it shows her thought process before the big Maddie or Jake pick, but to me it felt like nothing but filler. Filler? I hardly know her. Speaking of lack of filling, this whole Jake versus Maddie fiasco was so anticlimactic. This is the season two finale. And instead of having that Hannah Montana, who is she gonna pick moment, where she breaks the harsh news to one and then rejoices with the other, she picked Maddie off screen. And Maddie ended up being the one to tell Jake. The Jake slander and cuckolding has gone too far. She couldn't even break the news to him herself. Look at this sad and pathetic display as he pretends he's okay with everything. Don't hate the player, hate the game. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. So all of that was established within the first five minutes. So what now? Oh, they're just establishing the next season and throwing in a new problem. What are we looking at? Jenna gets encouraged by everyone to go to Europe for the summer, but she's a afraid of losing Maddie because he doesn't want to go. Her mom tries to warn her not to hold herself back. Before Jenna's mom was with her dad, she dated this guy named Ben. She told Jenna that she never danced because Ben didn't want to, even though she loved to dance. Hold on to that. At this end of the year party, Jake and Tamara kissed. At first, Jenna was pissed, but then she realized, oh wait, I I'm not dating Jake anymore. I shouldn't care. 
Interesting. The episode closes with Jenna telling Maddie that she's not going to go to Europe and she's going to stay home with him. When she gets up to dance with her friends, Maddie pulls her down to his lap saying, ah, I, I, I don't really want to dance. And she stares wistfully at Tamara and Jake on the dance floor, wondering if she made the right decision. Dear Lord, if you think that's indecisive, you're not ready for season three. Jenna's bad girl era. What? Season three is double the length of either of the seasons that came before, and its premiere was split in two. 3B is really where it's at, so let's try to get through 3A as quickly as possible. Lightning round. Jenna had a pregnancy scare. Maddie was betrayed by Jenna that she didn't tell him about this pregnancy scare when she told Jake, like she just blurted it out to Jake. Ricky Schwartz, Tamara and Sadie's ex, is dead. While editing, I found a whole page dedicated to saving the character. Who cares? Jenna's new creative writing teacher has such mean zingers that he would put Gordon Ramsay to shame. Okay, so let's see what kind of losers we have this year. I'm afraid of failing. Well, you don't have to be afraid anymore, because if that's the best you got, you've already failed. Get out of my class. I'm afraid I masturbate too much. You do. Don't be so obvious. There's this dude in her creative writing class named Colin. You can tell he's going to be important later because of the way he cheats out to the camera. Almost as if to say, take a good look at this face. This is the main conflict of season three. Season three, episode six, displays another way there's trouble in paradise. At Colin's girlfriend's Halloween party, Jenna loves the fact that everyone thinks she's cooler than Maddie for once. And Maddie clearly isn't taking not being in the spotlight well. Their secret desire to constantly one-up each other is a huge red flag in both directions. Jenna secretly resents him and Maddie secretly enjoys people thinking he's out of her league. At the end of the episode, we hear Jenna's very shallow look at what she likes about Maddie. What do you like about me? Abs, teeth, abs, hair, abs. This is especially painful because meanwhile, Maddie seems like he genuinely loves Jenna. The best person I know in every moment I spend with you, I get better. Uh, awkward. <laughs> Season three, episode seven, Maddie confronts his fear of dancing because he knows Jenna wants to dance with him. And this is a really cute scene, like Jake is teaching him a few moves, straight up endearing as shit, which is gonna make the rest of the season even more painful. Immediately, I was right. The tension with Colin and Jenna began next episode. He grabbed Jenna's arm and started rubbing it while he was on the phone with his girlfriend. The way he cheats out to the camera. I guess that wasn't the only cheating he was doing. Ayo, up top. By episode 10, Maddie is laying it all out. He can't continue to make amends about how their relationship started forever. And Jenna never even asked how he was doing with his parents since he was literally kicked out. It's all about her all the time. And by the end of the episode, she proves this accusation by kissing Colin. Guys, the cheating drugs and betrayal arc has started. Episode 11 is the second most memorable thing to happen all series. So Colin and Jenna keep their affair going, even stumbling backwards into her house and making out because they didn't think anyone was home. Turns out there was a whole surprise party there for her and everyone just saw that. She breaks up with Maddie and starts dating Colin with zero shame. And Maddie is still being really nice about the whole thing, which is making it clear who we should be rooting for. But it backfired because I don't want to see him get back together with somebody who cheated on him. They really lean into Jenna's villain era, having her lash out at her friends for them not immediately embracing Colin with open arms. Season three, episode 14, she smokes weed for the first time. And then when she was caught by the police, she said she's calm, cool, and convicted. And the bitch had to be high because a better play on calm, cool, and collected would have been calm, cool, and arrested. Slant rhyme. You're supposed to be a fucking writer? Get out of my class. Colin introduces Jenna to Adderall while all her ex-friends are participating in an after-school special about her. The comedy of this was the perfect mix of edgy and funny, as Sadie just had way too much fun playing Jenny. What are we gonna do about Jenny? Which is why I get high just to make it through the day. Also, instead of saying PSA, Valerie made an acronym for after-school special, which spelt out ass. And this joke felt specifically like it was made for me because I love PSAs and I love ass. Episode 16, everything came to a head when Jenna ran away from home after being grounded to try ecstasy. And here is where the most iconic scene of the series takes place. Jenna has a bad trip and tells Colin she's uncomfortable and is going to go home. He says, okay, 
Bye. And makes out with the girl right in front of her. She didn't even pivot turn out the club door. And he was already sucking another girl's face. How does it feel? Do you get deja vu when he does it to you? Do you get deja vu? Bitch! Boom! It's wild that this series started with everyone shitting all over Jenna and me feeling bad for her. But then my favorite moment of the series was her lowest point. Because damn, she earned it. After Colin breaks her heart, she has the audacity to call Maddie to pick her up. And he does. Then Jenna cried because she found an earring in his car that wasn't hers. Did you expect him to wait for you? The grass isn't always greener on the other side, Ethan Slater, Ned Fulmer, Jenna Hamilton, and, and Hamilton. The world was wide enough for both Hamiltons to cheat. I can own how forced that Feralton cutaway was. It's almost as forced as this season's B-plots. How do they fit so much in 20 minute episodes? So Sadie is dating Austin now and I really like the way he's written, except for the fact that he's dating Sadie. I don't know why these two characters are dating. Don't you see, Athena? The heart is an unpredictable, untamable child that cannot be explained. Fuck that, you are a TV show. At least try to explain it. Also, Jake and Tamara broke up because she took being class president from him. Never underestimate a girl bossing Rosati. Usually I'm on his side, but he's being such a sore loser and Tamara was right. She literally said, you're not trying hard enough for this position and I want the class president to care. Someone like me. Plus with Jenna's train wreck, this B-plot had no impact. Episode 18, old Jenna picks up with Valerie being suspended, which Jenna feels really bad about. Jenna is also on friendship probation with Ming and Tamara, but most of the demands are reasonable. One of which being, stop talking about your own problems and help us with ours for once. Something she didn't do, all season. Or really ever. So if anything, their demands are making her a better person. Which is clear she needs desperately because she's already thinking about getting back together with Maddie. Leave him alone. Jenna saw Maddie kiss someone else and then she started spiraling, started drinking even though she was supposed to be her friend's designated driver, and then made out with Jake. Tamara was rightfully upset, but this actually helped Tamara and Jake get back together somehow. I don't ask me how, I don't know. But the point is, Jenna thinks she's the sun with everything revolving around her. Or maybe she's the earth with the moon representing her side dicks like Jake or Colin. And Maddie is the stagnant sun unable to escape the earth's pollution. Jenna's way of making it up to everyone was cleaning up Maddie's house after the rager. And she also made muffins in the morning for all of them. And it worked? Everyone just forgave her because of that? Okay. Season three, episode 19 goes into Jenna's guilt about Valerie, but Maddie said it best. She did all of those inappropriate things. You just wrote about it. Like honestly, of all the things Jenna did on her bitch bender, that was the only positive one. Valerie publicly thirsted after high school age boy. She should not have her job. Okay, I put it off long enough, but we need to talk about Ming's storyline. I hate that the secret student organization is- The Asian Mafia. What? It had such racist undertones, overtones, and what adds insult to injury is these actors did a great job and had a lot of funny moments, like Becca, the leader of the group, doing her head nod, followed by a head shake, followed by a head nod, followed by a head shake, which never failed to confuse Ming. They did this head shake exchange like a thousand times. Commitment to the bit repetition to the highest degree. Family guy on uppers type shit. Back to Jenna, she convinced herself that Maddie was gonna ask her to junior prom, which sounds fully delusional after the series of events we just followed, but in her defense, and I hate to defend her, it really did look like he was going to. He kept hanging out with her and their new friend Bailey and asked her and their new freshman friend Bailey if they were going to prom and then texted Jenna that he had to ask her something later. Then the something he asked her was, are you cool with me taking Bailey? Because he obviously noticed she was getting her hopes up. Did you have to invite yourself to her house to ask that? Like I said earlier, I understand how Jenna mistook this. The season finale was 40 minutes long and I think it would have been the strongest conclusion to this series. Bailey turned down Maddie even though she liked him back because she didn't want to lose Jenna as a friend. And she knew Jenna wanted to go with him too. Jenna hears about this and assured Bailey that they'd still be friends even if she went with Maddie and that she'd be totally fine with it. So she really encouraged Bailey, go with Maddie. So Maddie and Bailey go to junior prom together. Jenna was contemplating going stag because she was so embarrassed and hurt. She finally realized the permanent consequences of her actions and through thinking about it, realized why she lashed out in the first place. It was because in her own words, she didn't love herself Aww. enough. To prove she finally was a person worthy of everyone's forgiveness, she recounts the lessons she's learned from everyone in her life and decides to dance by herself. Also her asshole writing teacher was the author of the book that touched her heart so dearly and he let the success of his first book get to his head so much that he fell off and the second book was ripped to smithereens 
Nazarenes, so he became a teacher to bestow the knowledge of his failure to the future generation of writers like Jenna. This was not the episode to watch high. It threw so much at us all at once. Like, why did the teacher have so much depth by the end? When did I start caring about Jenna again? Why am I kind of happy for her and enjoyed this as a conclusion and dread watching the rest knowing it'll fall short? Remember how the writing teacher was warning people about falling off? Perfect segue into season four. The premiere of this season was another 40-minute episode, and I guess they needed all that time to introduce a totally new cast of characters. Ming was unceremoniously written off the show, and so was Bailey. Yeah, the new girl that was supposed to be Jenna's new friend and Maddie's new fling? Completely meaningless now. Now there's another new girl, Ava, who's Tamara and Jenna's friend. For now. Jenna is pretty much at the bottom of her class, so she's dreading applying to colleges. Oh cool, we'll view her journey career-wise and not through her love life. Oh my god, her and Maddie are making out. Speaking of messy, Tamara and Jake broke up for real this time, leading to him diss-tracking her in the hallway. Tomorrow never comes. Kind of a cell phone there, buddy. And she also started to catfish him. I'm surprised MTV didn't throw Neve and Max in there for a network crossover jerk-off. A lot of the season is also dedicated to slut-shaming the sophomore girls, because it's clear the senior girls are intimidated by them taking their exes. Jenna visited SEU and started dating a college boy named Luke. Maddie sloppily kissed Sadie, and Ava snapped a pic of them getting snuggly as blackmail to Sadie, because she has a whole-ass boyfriend. When Ava brought up the pic to Sadie, Sadie was like, please, you know nothing happened. But like, Something did happen. I'm so confused. Does she not realize the whole thing is cheating? A few episodes later, and apparently she does know because she confessed to Austin. But she was still surprised when he broke up with her. All these characters have next level delusion. Ava starts dating Maddie, and it's discovered that Ava is a compulsive liar. Dead set on making everyone else in Maddie's life look bad so she can be his everything. It would be impossible to keep track of all her lies, but basically she's the antithesis of the great friend they had in Bailey, who they killed off for this? It all feels so dull. Oh no, she's actually lying about her life and her real name and she stabbed a kid when she was younger. And now she's faking being pregnant so Maddie could stay with her forever. The best part was seeing Maddie leave that abusive relationship and take his power back. But it feels like this plot was used to erase Maddie and Jenna's past. Sure, Jenna cheated on him, but she's chill now. And Ava's crazy. She's so much better than Ava. Jenna and Maddie should get back together. It shits on everything the season three finale was. Plot lines I didn't get into. Luke broke up with Jenna when Jenna was prioritizing Maddie over him. Maddie's parents got a divorce and Maddie was also dealing with the fact that they kept that he's adopted secret from him. And they threw all of this at us before they even resolved his brother being an alcoholic storyline that led nowhere. Spoiler alert, none of these Maddie trauma plot lines go anywhere. He meets his bio dad in season five, but he really doesn't like him or want to call him dad and then, it, and then it just ends. No resolution. That's it. We just see him get shit on to feel worse for him and congratulations it worked. Also, another thing I didn't know when to bring up, or if I even should, trigger warning and timestamp on screen, but something that was mentioned in season one and season three is that Maddie said he felt at my grandparents' special ed neighbor when I was 11. <laughs> And apparently she put his hand on her boob. This story is so vague and yet has so many implications. Was the neighbor able to consent? He wasn't, he was only 11. How old was the neighbor? Was this pedophilic as well as being ableist? It feels like a Miranda Sings Ew. joke. Another plot line I haven't mentioned yet is Tamara being bisexual and or exploring her sexuality. And they really dropped the ball on what could have been a really fun side plot. Although Val saying by Curious George is probably the best line in the entire show. It's just too bad it was followed up with. Once you've knocked a few back, a mouth is just a mouth. Compared to Awkward, faking it is perfect by rep. Okay, second half of season four, lightning round. Lissa's dad is gay. Sadie and Sergio hooked up. Jake hooked up with someone old enough to be his mom. Jenna and Maddie once again had a quirky misunderstanding where he was looking for her to be his New Year's kiss, but because Jenna just couldn't wait and thought he ditched her, she hooked up with this guy named Owen. And with Maddie and Jenna's no New Year's hookup pack to each other, she ended up lying to him about her New Year's kiss. She said she didn't kiss anyone. This will they, won't they, and Jenna lying is just seasons one through three all over again, and I'm just struggling to care. 
Jenna didn't get into SCU, even though literally everyone else did. But her silver lining lesson that she keeps repeating to herself through all of this is that if she's gonna be a writer, she has to get used to rejection. Wait, what the fuck? She still wants to be a writer? Biggest plot twist of the series. We have not seen Jenna blog all season. Also, Jenna was casually seeing that sophomore Owen that she hooked up with, even having sex with him. But when she realized she took his virginity, she got really freaked out and broke it off. Then Tamara hooked up with Owen. Tamara didn't know Jenna had a history with him. But then when Jenna drops that truth bomb, on her, she follows it up with, but I'm done with him now, so, so, so you can have him. You can have it. Which obviously hurt Tamara's feelings. Then Jenna told off Owen for hooking up with Tamara because everyone needs Jenna's permission to do anything. Maddie is going out with this girl Gabby and Jenna gets jealous. It's appropriate that this comes to a head on his birthday because this shit is getting old. <laughs> Jenna and Maddie could not have any more signs from the universe and each other that they're not meant to be. I can even see this being a joke on the show, like... Who said Maddie and I are officially over? It's not like it's written in the stars or anything. Or maybe it is. <laughs> Maddie and Jenna make out while Maddie is still going out with Gabby and right after Gabby also befriends Jenna. Gabby is such a nice girl too. This is so unnecessary. Gabby even forgives Maddie and they keep dating. But it's clear that that heartbreak didn't fully heal because Gabby sleeps with Jake while her and Maddie are still together. Also, when Maddie wanted to tell Jenna something, Jenna's mom interfered and said, stop stringing Jenna along. You've already broken her heart enough. Pardon? Boo, you know damn well your daughter did most of the heartbreak between the two of them. Lacey, what has gotten into you? A baby. A baby has gotten into her. Jenna's mom is pregnant. The final season I really have to split into two parts because narratively it feels like two separate seasons. The first half takes place during the final few months of high school. Jenna overhears what happened between Jake and Gabby and contemplates whether or not she should tell Maddie. She doesn't and of course when this all blows up, Maddie gets super pissed at Jenna for not telling him. Because everything always has to come back around to their relationship. The way he found out she knew was also crazy. He punches Jake in the face and then looks straight at Jenna and said, you knew, didn't you? My guy, that should be the least of your worries right now. Jake and Gabby are now dating and everyone's clowning on Maddie for being mad about it. Well, that's putting it a bit generously, I must admit. Maddie didn't really lose his cool about Jake hooking up with Gabby. He more so lost his cool about his reputation. He essentially said, Nothing you can do can hurt me, Jake. You're supposed to have my sloppy seconds, but not me. And the next part is a direct quote. I'm Maddie fucking McKibben. Weird middle name. Oh, by the way, ever since the season four finale, Tamara's been engaged to this military man named Adam. At Adam and Tamara's engagement party, they did the classic trope of a character, in this case Jenna, giving a speech and absolutely failing at it until they go off script and start talking about someone else. Can you guess who that someone else is? It's Maddie. It's obviously Maddie. It's always been Maddie. And they really drive this point home season 5 episode 6 where she's being haunted by her ex's past in a nightmare. They tell her all the ways they ruined the relationship or use them to make herself feel better about not being with Maddie. All roads lead back to Maddie. Her wake up call is when she was asleep. Wow, poetic. How'd it take her this long to realize? Also, this is the first time we've seen her type in forever and it's not even real. She's in a dream. Also, have we ever seen her write about anything other than herself? The answer is no. At prom, Maddie and Jenna have this ongoing adorable thing where they just keep barely missing each other. When she leaves the party, he arrives. When he leaves the party, she arrives. If this was a rom-coms tropes drinking game, I'd be dead right now. Maybe I already am. Is this hell? It's gotta be because Maddie and Jenna are back together. Yeah! Woohoo! Yeah! But then they kind of broke up for a second because Maddie's soccer training starts right away and they don't have the summer together anymore. But then they realized, wait, <laughs> we have phones. We can talk to each other far away. If we're so convinced we're in love, why don't we just try long distance? Episode 13 onward focuses on their life one year after college, or one year since high school ended. Very unsurprisingly, when Jenna returns home, she is shocked that things changed without her being there to witness it. She saw Lissa and Jake making out and literally says, I'm not even joking. W what are you doing? Jenna, what the fuck? What does it look like they're doing? Why do you care? Sadie and Tamara are also best friends now, and Jenna has a summer internship at this place called Idea Bin, which they describe as direct quote, blended journalism and personal essays with listicles and quizzes, which just sounds like what BuzzFeed was. Jenna would work at BuzzFeed. And also her and Maddie aren't together anymore. Oh. The biggest plot twist in all of season five is that their breakup was actually Maddie's fault. He hates college and quit soccer because it wasn't immediately easy to him. And while he was right about Jenna's friends being pretentious, A, what did you expect? And B, you didn't have to lose your cool so freaking quickly. They were in the middle of a party and he was like, I hate your friends, let's leave. 
Like, in front of them, I think he also was lashing out because he expected his time with Jenna to be easy. Which, A, when is it ever? And B, why are you prioritizing this relationship over college? Like, he was literally about to transfer to Jenna's school just to be with her. And Jenna's like, no, don't do that. This is an incredibly rash decision and you're gonna stifle your growth and mine. Which, while that's not an easy thing to hear, She's right. That's why Maddie broke up with her. Pretty weak, I must say. That was like a sophomore Maddie move. While at Idea Bin, Jenna starts going out with Luke again. Luke is so hot and so perfect and, and, and God, he was done dirty. They were great together until the last episode. Listen to this bullshit. Okay, so SAU was Jenna's dream school, but then she didn't get in, so she went to Wyckoff. But then through Luke's encouragement and through his recommendation, she actually gets into SEU. And she was thinking about transferring there until everybody convinced her that she was doing exactly what Maddie did. Oh, you're only transferring there for Luke. She literally knew about the college before she started going out with Luke. Like, I don't know why everyone jumped to this conclusion, because it's clear the audience was supposed to think this way as well, but I didn't. The final kick in the face of this series was she kissed Maddie while she was still with Luke. We never saw her break up with Luke or tell him about this. We were just supposed to be happy because Maddie and Jenna are back together. I thought the whole lesson of season three was don't cheat, but apparently the only lesson was don't cheat on Maddie. Cheating is fine as long as you're with Maddie. I stand by what I said time and time again. It should have ended at the season three finale. There were some standout moments here and there from season four and season five, but not enough to justify this crazy journey they brought us on. It was not enough to justify doubling the amount of episodes. It also gets incredibly difficult to follow. Here's a visual depiction. This is a chart depicting all the relationships and hookups if the show ended at season three. Oh wow, that's a lot, Athena. You're thinking to yourself, all right, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, hold on to that. This is a chart by the end of the series. We have Maddie and Jen at the center because everything revolves around them. Look at how many times they broke up and got back together. Also, I have her still dating Luke and dating Maddie because again, we don't know what happened with either of them. There was no closure. Freddie, who is Ming's boyfriend, is together with this random pregnant girl at the end. And through my research, I found out that even the cast of this show has trouble following what the hell happened. You date someone else in the back end of season five though. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Who's the guy from New York? What guy from New York? <laughs> you go to a clam bake. There's an episode about impressing rich friends. God, I, don't know. I think my conclusion is actually the general consensus because also the awkward wiki is updated up until season three or like mid season four and then they just gave up. I don't blame them. What the fuck is this? So is it camp or cringe? It is in this show's DNA to be cringe. It's called awkward and by God, it lives up to that name. Every episode starts with something painful to watch followed by the title card. One of the worst was her parents walking in on her masturbating. It's cringe. It's purposely cringe. I'm surprised I don't have a grimace stuck to my face. I was permanently like this watching. I was like, it's a big trend of the 2010s that didn't age the best. I feel like some could argue that it's also camp because it is purposeful, but I personally think that element is completely lost because of the cruel nature of the show. Fun fact, I had a stress nightmare about this show. In the dream, I was watching an episode of Awkward and in the show, Maddie got eaten by a shark and the whole school was cheering. And I shit you not, in the dream, I was just watching with horror being like, well, damn, I don't think he deserved all that. So note to self, don't watch Awkward while Shark Week is happening. But also I think my subconscious was trying to tell me that I just feel too bad for the characters. It wasn't as enjoyable as I really wanted it to be. If you want messiness, if you want an elaborate love heptadecagon, and if you can stomach some of this shock out humor, then this series is for you. Personally, I think I'll stick to faking it for my trashy guilty pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the birth of a new series. Because again, you do one video on something, it's just a video. You get two. Here we are. What do you want to see next on Camp or Cringe? Next week is Elena of Avalor Lore, or as I will be titling it because you guys just seem to love this play on words, Elena of Avalor. <laughs> I see what you did there. Stay tuned and have a great day. Bye!